Yes, I'm biased to think that bond markets are so important because I covered them for so long and I love them. But I do think that for economies, for, for governments, for companies, for people, you know, it is so often where rubber meets road. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. This week, we're back with another new idea, a different kind of new idea. We're starting a book club. Every few months, we'll choose a book with an interesting take on one of the topics we cover on the podcast, and we'll bring the author on the show. Today, we're talking to Mary Childs, journalist and host of the podcast, Planet Money. She's the author of the new book, Bond King, How One Man Made a Market, Built an Empire, and Lost It All. The book follows the rise and fall of PIMCO's co-founder, Bill Gross. His best new idea happened back in the 1970s. Gross was one of the first people to put into practice the idea of trading bonds. So, Mary, you wrote a book about a man who basically revolutionized the bond market or bond trading. Can you just start just with the most basic explanation of what a bond is and how bonds work? Bonds are basically just a loan. So it's money lent from one party to another with an agreed upon repayment date and, you know, a schedule of interest payments along the way. And, you know, if you have a mortgage, you're a bond issuer. There are so many ways that our debt gets packaged into these types of securities and traded in what's called the secondary market by investors. And that's actually the kind of legendary innovation that Bill Gross and his cohort had was the ability to trade these things. Because in the olden days, bonds were just, you know, you would have a little certificate, a beautiful, elaborate certificate from whatever issuing company that said, the bearer of this thing, we owe this much money. And here are little tiny literal coupons at the bottom of this piece of paper that you can tear off and mail in for those regular interest payments. And nobody did much more than just tear off those coupons at the time. When Bill Gross came along, you know, he started at Pacific Mutual in 1971, and he and a kind of cohort of peers in Southern California and across the country started to trade these things and started to create that secondary market, the ability to sell this bond because it's not looking as good anymore. I don't I don't like this company anymore. I think the inflation paradigm is whatever. For whatever reason, you can sell this bond that you don't like anymore and go find a different bond, a new bond with maybe a higher interest payment. So it was basically boring at one point. People who had money could say, oh, I'm going to get rid of my $10,000 in cash that's lying around. I'm going to buy a bond and I'm going to get that $1,000 back at some future date. But in the meantime, I'm going to get these fairly small coupon payments, right? The interest on the bond. And you just sort of sit back and passively collect your interest income and then you get your principal back at the end. It was supposed to be sort of a boring exercise, a safe thing to hold, but they weren't perfectly safe, right? You mentioned companies. So these bonds are issued by lots of different players, and there's still some risk involved. Of course. So there is always a risk that, you know, the issuing company will run into trouble, that maybe the economy turns or they have some kind of management problem or whatever the issue may be. There's always a world in which the issuer is like, oh, no, I can't make this interest payment. And furthermore, I'm not going to be able to pay you this money back. You know, they may go bankrupt. They may be insolvent. But, you know, you make that determination at the outset when you're saying, am I going to lend to this company or not? And that's really what Bill Gross's job was at Pacific Mutual at the outset, where he was a credit analyst. He was looking at potential borrowers and saying, hmm, do I like this credit? Should we lend to this company? And you should account for the risk that you see in that company in that interest payment, right? You kind of factor in the interest rate so that you're being compensated for the risk that the company brings. So what was it that Bill Gross could do that everybody else couldn't do? If you're all studying the same set of companies and evaluating risk, why would there be such a difference of opinion that would create a market for trading these things? Well, differences of opinion always make markets. I think Bill, more than a lot of people, was just really enthusiastic about new stuff. Like anytime some new contract or product came to market, he was extremely enthusiastic about getting to know it, learning all the all the various contours of it. And 
that was true here. You know, a lot of people at the time, bonds were where you went to do kind of the boring work because it was that boring instrument. So the people that worked in bonds were really conservative. Like, why would you want to introduce this new risk of trading with people and selling them and buying new ones? Like, this all sounds stressful. This was one of those situations where Bill was the young gun, you know? He's like, let's do this fun new thing. Just give me a little pile of money to invest. And the insurance company they worked for, somewhat surprisingly, said yes. How much did they give? Five million. <laughs> so it started with five million. And explain the concept of total return, because I, I guess what was always a little confusing for me was total return always kind of the vision here, or did it kind of just emerge to that? There's sort of the buying and selling, and then there's the interest payments. And did he kind of like just naturally see that those two would go together, or were they kind of separate activities for a while? I think they always kind of went together. Like it, it is the case that you're going to have the income from the interest payments and your money back at the end, and that's what you expect. But in Bill's world, in this new world of trading bonds, you're going to get maybe more than that. You're going to get price appreciation. And combined with that you know, existing expected pile of returns, that's total return. So you get that added dynamic from the secondary market from trading that gives you this extra potential for upside. And I think it does go hand in hand because the whole idea of trading is kind of predicated on this hope for price appreciation that you're going to do better. One of the guys I talked to who was just an absolute riot is this guy, Howard Rakoff, and he likened it to driving on the highway. And if you stay in one lane, that's when you're just investing in bonds, you're buying bonds, you're clipping your coupon, you're just staying in your lane. But if you change lanes, you put on your little blinker, you go a little ahead of somebody, that's trading bonds because you're going to get home a little bit faster than that last person than if you had stayed in that lane. And so you pass one person and then you get in another lane and you pass another person and sooner or later you add all that up and the cumulative effect is price appreciation, is total return. So you're getting a little bit more than you would have in this case time by just staying in that lane. Talk a little bit about the PIMCO and, and Gross's bet on the, the housing market crashing. They were way ahead of the curve. It was pretty easy to see what was happening in 2008. They were seeing it in 2006. Yeah, they saw the seeds of this way before most people. And I think it's, it's you know, Paul McCulley was a great economist at PIMCO, and he was a big disciple of Hyman Minsky. So he said, you know, it's this concept that there would be an accrual of risk in the system because the further you get from the last crisis, the more, you know, people kind of forget. And they're like, well, this looks kind of nice, this risky little investment. I Bad things really don't happen that much anymore. I'm going to try it. And people just increasingly take their chances. And then eventually all of that adds up into what he called a Minsky moment when, you know, things start to turn and the spiral starts. So you had Paul and then you had the mortgage desk at PIMCO, which had been studying and, you know, going out into the country and talking to brokers and, you know, mortgage lenders and getting a feel for the temperature of the housing market in the country. And I think among all of these people, there was this consensus that there has to come a point when the next person's not going to buy the house. You know, there's not going to be a buyer at the next high price. And eventually, you know, rubber meets road. People aren't going to be able to make these payments and something will happen. The thing will turn. Now, did they expect the extent of the crisis? I think they were surprised by the extent, too. Of course, they they didn't kind of predict that Lehman would fall, but they were really ahead of the game getting that view. Is that a window into how Gross works and how he became the bond king? I mean, obviously, the strategy of buying and selling bonds and the total return, but is it also just about always kind of trying to be ahead of the competition with an extra layer of digging and research. Is that part of the genius of Bill Gross? Oh, yeah. I think that intensity of focus is difficult to replicate and certainly was one of their kind of winning parts of their formula. Bill kind of is always going to be more competitive and more intense than the next guy. So that absolutely generates outperformance. You know, if you're just trying that much harder and taking a concerted amount of risk, a, an informed amount of risk, you, you probably more often than not will outperform your peers. It's also a really good marketing story, right? So it's actually kind of the dual Bill Gross genius where not only is he good at the investing and getting his arms around the details and understanding what he's doing and taking that kind of really informed risk, he's also incredibly good at spinning it into a story and telling people about it. And people are like, oh, wow, that does make sense. And then it sticks in your mind. And I think both of those are, are really major parts of PIMCO's success. 
you talk about Bill Gross, like the young Bill Gross, before he really got his start, getting injured, right? And sitting in the hospital and reading these books. And the books were basically about, you know, how to beat the house in the, you know, casinos. They were gambling books. And he learns these kind of lessons that he then takes and applies in his life. And I think I've heard him say that it taught him that he could bet against the house and win. So if he thinks that he was betting against the house and winning, who was the house in this scenario? He's talking about beating the system, right? Beating this machine. And he had that experience, like you say, in Vegas, where he counted cards. And that was his way of taking back the you know house advantage of saying, okay, you exploit an advantage and that's your whole game and that's how you make money. Me too. I'm going to do that too. And, you know, your odds are never going to be better than 51% or whatever, but you lean in when you know you have the odds in your favor and you lean out when you don't. He applied that to the bond market where I think the house is just this enormous interconnected system of lenders and borrowers, of central banks, of mutual funds, and he learned that he could scrape things out of it. You know, collectively, it becomes kind of its own animal, right? It becomes this ecosystem that has its own dynamic, which, you know, changes over time for sure, but absolutely acts like a living thing at times, and people spend their lives trying to outsmart it. And Bill found a couple ways in which he could exploit inefficiencies in that market, exploit other people's fear or need for reassurance or various other things that he found he could collect a premium for. Coming up, what was really behind Gross's motivation to become the Bond King? That's after the break. Welcome back to the best new ideas in money. Before the break, we heard about how Bill Gross's knack for beating the house in Las Vegas and a lot of good luck helped PIMCO eventually dominate the bond market. We also wanted to know what inspired Mary Childs to spend seven years following this one man's story. One of the things that fascinated me is that Bill Gross was more interested in fame than money. Obviously, he made a lot of money, but what does that tell about him and why did that maybe help him in terms of advancing his career and PIMCO? I mean, I feel like if he was just after money, the story might have been a little different. No, I think that's right. And you see a lot of hedge fund managers, I think in particular, who aren't motivated by fame and who don't want to mess with it, and their behavior is really different. In the mutual fund game, you know, your fees are lower than in hedge funds. So it is to some extent to your benefit if you can collect more assets. And so obviously being a great marketer is part of that. Being on TV is part of that. And Bill says he has this big break when, you know, he gets booked on Lou Rukeyser's show, Wall Street Week in the 1980s. We have Bill Gross coming in from California. So Mm -hmm. let's hear his perspective. Well, I disagree with them. And that was what everybody watched. It was this huge like appointment viewing Friday night PBS show. And people tuned in and he was like the bond market guy. So if you're trying to think about what's going on in bonds, you only really know this one name, this one guy who really gets it. And he talks in this kind of colloquial, cute way. And I think that really does help. You know, the more you have money coming in the door, the better you can take advantage of opportunities you see in the market. And people always thought that PIMCO's size was a disadvantage, you know, caused them to be unable to pick the best credits. They had to just buy all the credits or maybe they were just subject to the winds of interest rates, which over the course of Bill's career was actually probably fine. But in the fixed income markets, Actually, being big is helpful because you get the first call when somebody's issuing a new bond and the underwriter needs a giant anchor to buy a huge slug of the bond so that everyone else will also buy the bond. They'll be like, oh, PIMCO's buying? Okay, fine. I'll buy two. And those bonds nearly always pop when they're issued. So there are ways in which this size was an advantage. And that's a credit to their performance, sure, but also telling people about their performance. That's kind of reminds me of what you said earlier when you talked about, you know, staying in one lane versus signaling and changing lanes. This is kind of signaling, right? When you're telling the rest of the market how you're positioned, it's a way to get people enthusiastic about following the leader and therefore you become even more successful by nature of the size and the signaling effect. 
quite. People definitely looked to Newport Beach and to Bill for, you know, what they were doing, what they thought would happen in the economy, but also the exact trades that they thought were good ideas. And there was always talk that like, oh, someone would be on TV telling you that Bank of America securities are cheap and then, you know, they're the ones selling it to you. So take that with some salt. But I think that's always the case, right? There's there's always some degree of like, yeah, we hold a lot because we really like this Bank of America, whatever. But to some extent, there if someone's going to buy it for a lot of money, like why wouldn't you sell it? So... But I think that that is the signal effect is so powerful and was such a big part of this. You know, he was this big, bold face name in the market and everybody followed what they did. You know, the beach could move markets. So let's talk about how this all starts to unravel. You know, he goes from being the Bond King to kind of, I don't know if you could say there was a coup d'etat, but did he lose his touch? I think, you know, there are two different facets here. One is the market performance side and the other is the kind of PIMCO managerial, PIMCO business side. So on the performance side, Bill had this 2011 bad bet on treasuries. He sold all of his treasuries at kind of the random exact moment where you really didn't want to do that. And that was kind of a weird fluke. He apologized. We all moved on. But then in 2013, he again underperformed. And so this kind of one-two punch, you know, there was a year in between, but it was kind of, you know, you're only as good as your last trade. And especially within PIMCO, if you're trying to lead a bunch of these kind of stabby, perfectionist, intense people that you've trained to hunt (laughs) each other, like you're going to probably get some of that intensity turned on yourself. And then on the kind of business side, the business management and personal relationship side, Muhammad Alarian had come in as the co-CEO and co-CIO of PIMCO in 2007. And eventually in, you know, mid to late 2013, their relationship is just in shambles and it's not going to get better. And everybody's kind of trying to figure out how to fix it. And it's not possible. So in January 2014, Muhammad Alarian quits. He's like, I'm going to spend time with my family. I'm out. And then this big article comes out in the Wall Street Journal. Bill Gross avoids eye contact on the trading floor. He's intense. Well, let me give you my take. This whole past two months has been sort of silly, really. You know, breaking news, uh, Gross gets mad once in a while. Um, You know, not quite Rob Ford, Lindsay Lohan, or Chris Christie uh, types of headlines. Um, All this stuff that people within PIMCO knew, certainly, and a lot of counterparties maybe knew if they had interactions with PIMCO. But a lot of the, like, mutual fund world, a lot of the people who idolized Bill had no idea. And it was this change in public perception that, I think kind of helped to destabilize Bill to kind of drive him up a wall. Cause then he was like, well, okay, who's saying this stuff about me? Just like really got stuck in his craw. But also it created a chasm between him and the rest of the PIMCO's management because they were like, sir, can you focus? <laughs> like, why are you fixated on this thing? Like we need to move on. We need you to, to be a professional person here. We really should not be hyper-focusing on this incident, on who's leaking to the press. And you are also talking to the press. Like, what are we doing here? And that friction just became more and more over the course of 2014. And simultaneously, they're trying to work out a way for Bill Gross to step back. And so these things all at once are creating this kind of untenable dynamic where they're never on the same page. They're completely out of step. And eventually it comes to a head and he quits. In a surprise move, PIMCO's Bill Gross has left the company he founded more than four decades ago. Gross built PIMCO from the ground up into the world's biggest bond firm. He, he basically bond ghosted them. Turmoil. He ghosted them. It was definitely a you can't fire me, I quit situation. I think a lot of investors, you know, we, we, we tend to think of the people handling our money as sane, professional and diligent. And this behavior in Gross's case, you know, which did seem to get rather bizarre, it it seems like you can't separate the behavior from his performance, or can you? No, completely. I'm so you you've really hit on the thing that kind of blew me away where you definitely think that your money is being managed by somebody who can keep it together. Like they're always talking about, oh, I'm I'm stoic. You know, I, I'm able to suspend my emotion when I engage with the market. And that's why I don't, you know, panic and sell when things are fall. All of this stuff that that's part of the ideology in a way of money management. And it's just maybe it's true in some degree, but obviously they're people. And they, there's a scene in the book where Bill Gross is emailing the entire management committee about, you know, this meeting that they'd had. And Dan Iveson replies privately. And Bill writes back, putting all of the executive committee back on the email thread. 
the reply all thread just absolutely killed me because it's just like, you know that feeling where your blood is coursing through your veins and you're just, oh, they're, they messed with the wrong person, like typing furiously. And yeah, they're not they're not better than any of us in that way. They're the same. They're people. And I think you're right that like we wish that there was a world in which they don't bring all of that to work. And Bill Gross's trajectory at PIMCO in 2014 certainly illustrates the kind of terrible outcomes that you can have when people aren't able to suspend that. I'm curious because Wall Street, you've covered financial markets. There are thousands and thousands of quirky, interesting, successful people that you could have chosen to write about. Writing a book is hard. And so why did you decide to do it? And why did he become the person about whom you wanted to write this book? I think part of it's luck I just or a curse. I just was covering Pimco and Bill Gross when he left. So I just was in the story and I had, I covered credit markets for years. So I understood what they were talking about, which gave me a bit of an ability to speak their language, I think. And then also, you know, I just, I wrote a big story at Bloomberg News. You know, my colleague, Kathy Burton, helped me. All my colleagues and my editors helped kind of help me think about it and shape it and get the right points in. And I think from there, I was like, there's just so much. There's so much in here. And maybe more to the point, PIMCO is so important. They sit at this incredibly important inflection point in the economy. They have so much influence in the bond market, which is so influential in the world. And yet we understand so little about them in the kind of mainstream world. You know, if you're out talking to people at a party, and I know this from experience, if you say PIMCO, people are like, what? So <laughs> like I would tell them about my book. And for the most part, people would be like, uh, OK, what is that? And I would kind of I don't know. Like, yes, I'm biased to think that bond markets are so important because I covered them for so long and I love them. But I do think that for economies, for for governments, for companies, for people, you know, it is so often where rubber meets road. When you have these kind of enormous restructurings, they companies basically go into bankruptcy because they can't pay their their debt anymore. And then you you know the the massive effect can be can blindside people. Because we don't have this direct line, you know, for whatever reason, it's it's moded by jargon. It's moded by different types of products. And, oh, this is really complicated. And these things interact. And you don't know bond math. And it's all of this stuff that that serves to keep fees high and keep people out, but also serves to just, like, cloud the picture and doesn't allow people all, – all of this kind of noise, doesn't it doesn't allow people to see things clearly and to understand how their world works, which I find really annoying. So that was the basic – you know, the 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 true thing that was motivating throughout was that I love the bond market or whatever and thought it was poorly understood and that and that, you know, PIMCO is so central to it that this was the right story to be telling. Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like the show, please leave us a review. As you probably know, it's the best way for other listeners to discover us. If you have ideas for future episodes or a great book you'd like us to discuss, drop us a line or send us a voicemail at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Mary Childs. To learn more about bonds, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast for Market Watch produced by Best Case Studios. Suzanne Myers is our producer. Our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz Lockhart. The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For Market Watch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the associate producer is Katie Ferguson. Jeremy Binks is our news editor. This episode was mixed by Katie Ferguson. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the Market Watch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea. <laughs>